Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. Hello from Romania. Okay, as you join us, please let us know where you are. It's so nice to see. We always have people from so many different places. It's not any different right now. All right. Hello, Janine. Hello, exciting to see people from all over the world. I know. João from Brazil. Hello, João. Well, I'm biased. That's pretty cool. All right. So as we have um, a lot of people joining, so stay with us for uh, another minute or two. We're going to wait for more people to join. Um, and we'll start our webinar in uh, two minutes. Yeah, exactly two minutes. And um, you're sharing your screen, right, Janine? So you're, you're all yes. good? Okay. Yeah. Just making sure I have the, the, the right files open here. All right. Ukraine, Romania, Indonesia, Myanmar, Guatemala, Ireland, Taiwan. I, I just, I love this part. I love to see everybody joining from so many different places. It's like, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. From Lebanon, oh, cool. India, Saudi Arabia, Argentina. I love that all we right. can all come together so easily. I know. Okay, just a few more seconds. We, we still have a lot of people joining, so bear with us for just a few more seconds. And uh, we are right at the hour, so. Okay, well, while we have people joining, um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and get started with introductions. As we have more people arriving, we are more than 200 people already. Okay, well, let's let's go. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Building English Language Literacy and Content Knowledge for Academic Success, presented by Janine Boylan. We are very happy to be hosting this session and we would like to thank you, each one of you for, for joining us from so many different places. My name is Luciana Wilson. I am the product marketing manager for all content-based English programs at National Geographic Learning. Um, and you will see some of the examples of our materials here uh, today. Before we get started, I would like to take a minute to go over some of the functionality of the webinar platform. Um, first off, at the bottom of your screen, you will notice that there are several icons. Um, the first button on the left is the chat function. As I can see, most of you know where it is and know how to use it. Um, be sure to send your messages to all panelists and attendees to ensure that the whole group can see and, and read your message. And as a reminder, please keep the chat focused on our session. On the right, you will see a Q&A button. Uh, please do use this button to ask the presenter or the host any questions. We'll do our best to answer questions as they come in, but we'll also have dedicated time at the end of the session to go through questions with Janine. Um, finally, we will be sending along a certificate of attendance and a recording of the session within five business days of this webinar. 
So without any further delay, I am pleased to introduce today's speaker. Jenny Boylan is publisher of content-based English products at National Geographic Learning. She has nearly 25 years of experience in educational publishing for English learners with a focus on kindergarten to 12 grade schools segment. She has a master's in instructional science and technology, and she began her professional life as a teacher for young learners in the United States and in Japan. Well, now that you know more about our presenter, please welcome um, my National Geographic Learning colleague, Janine Boylan. Janine, welcome. Thank you, Luciana, and welcome to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm so delighted to have so many of you from all over the world. So my objective today is to share research-based practices to support students' language and literacy learning. I'm gonna be sharing instructional principles that are for all levels of learners, not just young learners or older learners, but for everyone. I'm gonna be showing you examples from um, National Geographic learning materials, but again, these practices work for all learners. So why should you care about research-based practices? They're proven strategies. Knowing that these work, why they work, and intentionally including them in your lessons will help you become an even more effective instructor. I've organized this presentation roughly around a teaching cycle, and I've based the practices largely on the work of two people who both researched and collected best practices for instruction, David Merrill and Barack Rosenshine. Um, if you're interested in the sources that I quote during this presentation, you'll see that I put them on the slides. So if you want to do further research of your own after this presentation, you have the names. So that I know a little bit more about you, can um, we initiate the first poll question and, and have you all answer it? I'm curious to know how many of you are familiar with Merrill's first principles and or Rosenshine's principles of instruction? So we'll leave that up there for a minute. And while you're answering this, um, let me tell you a little bit about these two studies. So over the course of several years, Merrill researched and reviewed instructional design theories in order to identify common principles. Merrill determined that although the theories used a variety of terms to describe their principles, the theories and models had many connections. He synthesized and summarized them into five principles and called them the first principles of instruction. Since publication, Merrill's principles have become foundational in many teacher training courses, so many of you may be familiar with them already. And then about a decade later, uh, Barack Rosenshine published another list of principles of instruction. Rosenshine based his on his study of cognitive science, research on the best practices of master teachers, and research on cognitive supports. And what's fascinating to me about Rosenstein's analysis is that even though these three sources are very different bodies of research, he found no conflict among them. Thank you um, for, public, for answering our poll question. And it's I'm, I, super helpful to see that some of you have heard about these principles, but um, many of you haven't. So thank you for answering that. So uh, Merrill's principles and Rosenstein's principles, no surprise, complement each other really well. And as I go through these, some of you may find that the practices look familiar. And that's great, because that means that you're familiar with research-based practices. And again, in this presentation, I'm going to share the principle and a little bit about the research behind the practices and kind of remind you that these are important things to intentionally include in our lessons. I'm going to share several ideas, and um, and then my last one of my last slides in this presentation will be a list of Merrill's principles and Rosenshine's principles, so that you can see them all in one place. So let's get started with Merrill's first principle: Learning is promoted when learners are engaged in solving real-world problems. So there are a number of ways to incorporate real-world problem solving into lessons. One is through inquiry-based learning. So let's pull up our second poll question. 
how many of you use inquiry based learning? A simple definition of inquiry based learning is starting with a question and then working through different sources of information to determine an answer. So while you're answering that question, um, inquiry can be open where students create their own questions and research to discover the answer, or inquiry could be guided where the teacher poses a question and provides support as students uncover their own responses. I'm showing an example here. Oh, great. It looks like a number of you do use inquiry based learning. Fantastic. And those of you who don't, I hope that, you know, we can teach you a little bit more about this approach. Um, so I was starting to say the example here is from a fifth grade book. And this is an example of guided inquiry. This is an introduction to a unit where students will study justice. And they'll be coming up with their own response to the question, what is justice? So Merrill notes that learners will assume ownership only if the problems to be solved are interesting, relevant, and engaging. So justice is something that students experience in their own lives. And maybe they can relate to this image where a player is getting a yellow card in the game. They might have feelings about if that's just or not. So they may have opinions already about this question of what is justice. But by doing an intentional reading, writing, speaking, and listening to several different perspectives on the topic, they're gonna to shape their answer to this question even more. And they're gonna gather reasons and evidence to back their ideas. This approach of guided inquiry has proven to be quite effective in learning. A recently published study that focused on guided inquiry in higher education confirmed that the process promotes students' critical thinking and this in turn made them more desirable as employee, employees because of critical thinking is such a, an important skill for an employee. Similarly, a middle school uh, based study found that guided inquiry encouraged students to own their own work, to be more intentional, intentional about what they were learning and therefore, it resulted in correcting misconceptions they had about concepts because they were really focused on the learning. A third and separate study reported that not only did it help students change their understanding and correct those misconceptions, but it also helped the support retention of the knowledge. So involving students in solving real world problems can be a very effective strategy. Merrill's second principle is that existing knowledge acts as a foundation for new knowledge. We need to start where the student is, allow them to connect what they already know to the new content, and this will help activate their learning. If we don't do this, there's cognitive overload. Learners feel overwhelmed and there's a barrier to learning. There are many places in a lesson where we can build on students' existing knowledge. Um, using cognates or known word parts to teach vocabulary, using familiar structures to teach grammar, and so on. I wanted to show you this example because this is an example that supports middle school students in their reading comprehension. Students are going to read a selection about a boy who gets lost in a field of reeds during a storm. Getting lost in a field, field of reeds may not be an exact activity that students can relate to but they may have um, experienced being lost from family or friends, being unable to find a family member, losing something that was special to them and so on. So this activity asks them to think about similar situations they have experienced and recognize that those experiences that they haven't too. So linking to and building on what learners already know, as well as recognizing what they don't know, makes them ready to receive new information. It also prepares them to continually monitor their connections throughout the lesson. So again, making existing knowledge 
a foundation for new knowledge reduces students' cognitive overload. A recent study with fifth and sixth graders focused on this idea of activating um, prior knowledge as a foundation for new knowledge. The students had the, uh, the, excuse me, the researcher had the students do exactly what we just talked about, connecting their knowledge to their prior knowledge, but also noting when information or a situation was different from their prior experience. And the, the study showed that making these intentional connections to their existing knowledge increased their comprehension. And also this approach helped both high achieving and low achieving students equally. Merrill's third principle is that learning is promoted when new knowledge is demonstrated to the learner. Rosenshein says, present or teach new information in small steps and provide models. Research suggests that our working memory, where we hold new information in our brain, <laughs> works best when we don't overload it. So it's important to deliver information in small steps. It's best to present the information, model it, and have students practice with that new information before moving on. Modeling reinforces learning. A think aloud is a really common way to model and provides the benefit of not only showing an example that's been worked through, but actually allows us as teachers to say out loud our, our thought process or the cognitive process involved, which really helps learners. Here's a, a little example from third grade on a lesson of how to retell a story. On the left, you can see how this lesson is broken down into small steps. And on the right, you can see the model. As a teacher, you can work through this. You can say, when I retell a story, I'm gonna start by telling what happens first. So in the story that I just read for pretend, <laughs> first a puppy ran away. Then I'm gonna tell what happens next. Well, then the family searched for it. Then I'm gonna tell what happens at the end. Finally, the family found the puppy. Breaking down the instruction into small steps and modeling the steps through a think aloud is an excellent way to help students write as well. So doing a think aloud about how to turn ideas into written sentences can really help students become comfortable writing. This model, I'm good, you know, you can probably imagine using this as a, a think aloud for writing as well. Um, I would say, if I want to write a story, I'm going to start by telling what happens next. Well, I know that the puppy ran away, so I'm going to write first a puppy ran away. Then I'm going to tell what happens next, and I want to I want to write. Then the family searched for it and so on. By going through this and modeling the think aloud, that really unlocks writing for students. So researchers studied the effects of modeling in elementary and middle school reading and writing classes. They discovered that providing explicit modeling of each step reduced the cognitive overload, it reinforced the learning, and it unblocks the learning. By providing explicit modeling of each step, students' learning dramatically improved. They did learn that if there wasn't enough modeling in, an, in a lesson, or if the modeling wasn't explicit, students actually had trouble learning. So this modeling is really helpful and important for our students. Next, after instruction and modeling comes practice. Merrill's fourth principle is learning is promoted when new knowledge is applied by the learner. Rosenshine's related principle is guide students as they begin to practice. Guiding students through their practice with the teacher and the student working together or with groups of students working together further prepares students to be successful and do the work on their own. The gradual release of responsibility is a popular framework that's built on this concept of practicing together. So another quick poll, Luciana, if you could pull it up. 
do you use the gradual release of responsibility framework in your teaching? While you're answering that question, let, let me go through what this framework is. Um, the gradual release of responsibility framework is based on the research of Piaget, Vygotsky, Bandura, Wood, Bruner, and Ross. So it's been, this, these ideas have been around for a while. It assumes that the cognitive load shifts intentionally and gradually from the teacher to the student. Fisher and Fry describe the gradual release of responsibility framework in four components. First, the teacher teaches with a focus lesson. Uh, some people refer to that as the I do it part of this. Then they transition to guided instruction where the teacher and the student is working together. This is the we do it part of the model. Then there's productive group work where students are working together, but the teacher is still overseeing it and ensuring that they're, they're um, answering the questions correctly or applying the skill correctly. And this is the you do it together part of the model. And then ultimately there's independent learning where students are doing the work on their own. But this has all been very intentional as the teacher's gradual release of the cognitive work shifts from the teacher to the student, so the student is fully prepared to be successful when they do the practice on their own. The key to guided practice, excellent, it looks like, thank you, Luciana, 74% um, of you use gradual release of responsibility and great. The key to guided practice is that students are not left on their own to practice. It ensures that students are practicing the correct way and are better prepared for independent practice. And research shows that when teachers provide sufficient guided practice, students are more successful at independent practice. So here's an example from um, a middle school program. I'm showing you part of the lesson. I'm not to uh, ensure that I don't have you to ensure that you don't experience cognitive overload, I'm only showing you the practice portion. Before this, the teacher would have done the explicit modeling and the think aloud that we talked about. And now the task is given to the students to work with partners to read this excerpt from the text. But you can see there's still supports here for the students as they do their work. This is just gradually shifting that, res that responsibility or that cognitive work from the teacher to the student. And the teacher is still monitoring and ensuring that students are really applying the skill correctly. As we're doing guided practice, Rosenshine's principles note that we want to ask a large number of meaningful questions. This might seem evident. Of course, we're going to ask questions and check to ensure students are understanding the material. But we need to include a large number of questions and meaningful questions to ensure that students are not just repeating back information, but they're taking in the material and really understanding it. Questions allow us to determine how well the material has been learned so that we can determine if we need to reteach or provide more modeling or more practice. In this example I'm showing, middle school students are asked to look at this um, image of the painting the scream. They go through these series of questions with each one encouraging them to show their understanding in a deeper way. If we just asked one question, students wouldn't be exploring their ideas as deeply or expressing their understanding as clearly. In addition, we want to, follow, we want to ask follow-up questions about the process that students are going through. Things like, that's true. What in the text made you realize that? Or, great idea. What made you think that? So we ask a large number of meaningful questions because that, that allows students to demonstrate their understanding of facts as well as the process, which is important. 
A research study showed that when students were, excuse me, when teachers were trained to increase both the factual and the process questions that they asked during guided practice, their students achieved higher scores than other classes where the teachers were not asking the, the same number of questions and both those factual and process questions. Rosenshein notes that we need to require and monitor independent practice. Independent practice and application is ultimately the reason for teaching. We want students to apply all the knowledge that we are teaching them. So I assume you all have your students do independent practice. But what does independent practice do? It helps students become fluent in a skill. And this is where that brain science comes in. It also helps transfer information from working memory to long-term memory, where it can be easily and quickly accessed. To do this, independent practice should um, needs to be the exact same material or the exact same skills as the guided practice. It's not appropriate to make independent practice more challenging than the guided practice that they had. Students need to be prepared for independent practice so they're successful. If we find that students are making a lot of errors in their homework, it's likely because there wasn't enough guided practice to prepare them to work independently. Ah, here's the transferring information from working memory to long-term memory. So for example, this is um, from our kindergarten program. So beginning readers who are learning phonics skills can read decodable readers like this one pictured. These are books or stories that are constructed to contain the exact phonics skills the students have learned and practice so that they can successfully read these books on their own. Before the teacher even presents this book, students have learned how to read the high frequency word my. They've learned the sounds for H, T, C, and P, and they've learned short A. They've done plenty of guided practice and reading of individual words. The teacher might even decide to do guided practice with some of the pages of this book together as a class to ensure success. And then with all of this background, the students are ready to successfully read independently. But of course, as teachers, we still need to monitor that they are, they are successful. Um, and, and research has shown that students are even more engaged in their independent seat work when a teacher is monitoring them. It optimally, it's only 30 seconds or less, but just um, if we have students do independent work and, and we're walking around the class and just doing a brief check-in with them, that's really engaging to learners. Taking the knowledge into the broader wor world I'm sorry, Merrill's fifth principle is that learning is promoted when new knowledge is integrated into the learner's world. Publicly demonstrating knowledge or exploring new and personal ways to apply the knowledge and skills cements it into the learner's experience. It goes from something that was learned to something that belongs to the learner. So going public with one's skills is motivating. Uh, when you level up on a game that you're playing, for instance, it's a reward to be on the leaderboard. Taking the knowledge into the broader world, like these take action activities, really allows learners to create, revise, and synthesize their knowledge. In this activity, learners have completed a unit about water. So they've read about water, they've um, talked about water, they've listened to others talk about water. And now in this activity at the very end, they're going to take all of that knowledge that they've gained and they're going to do something meaningful with it. In, in um, this program, we give them choices. They might choose to do something that is, uh, affects their personal life by tracking and reflecting on their own water use. They might choose to do something that is for the school and educating the school about the impact of food choices on water. They might do something for their community, improving the water quality in their community, or they might want to do something for their world. 
So again, integrating that knowledge into their world really makes it their own and cements that learning. Review. As teachers, we know this is important. So Rosenshine's research notes that we should begin lessons with a review, which is what this example from kindergarten does. The warm up activity is uh, right away, greeting students with hello and then giving them an opportunity to distinguish between M and, and S words, which they had just learned the, the day before. Rosenshine also notes that we need to have students review weekly and monthly. So why is review important? We all know that it requires a lot of repetition to become experts. To be a good piano player, you need to practice. Building in daily reviews for our students gives them repeated exposure, which leads to automaticity. But what happens in the brain when students are able to automatically do a skill, such as reading a word or conjugating a verb, is that content again shifts from the working memory to the long-term memory. And with content stored in long-term memory, there's more room for new content in the working memory. Also having a foundation of these patterns of knowledge in our long-term memory, it's easier to solve new problems and new content is easier to digest. So reviewing content essentially reduces the cognitive load. Another principle uh, that Rosenshine shares is providing scaffolds throughout the lesson. A scaffold is a temporary support to help a learner with a difficult task, like training wheels on a bike. A scaffold helps students be successful at the task. And the idea is that gradually scaffolds will be removed as the learner becomes more independent. A scaffold could be sharing language frames like this, these for carrying out a speaking or a writing activity and sharing different levels of language frames for different levels of learners. Or it could be providing alternate outcomes based on students' levels like this activity down here. It could be providing a checklist of tasks to do for an activity. The key is that all learners still meet the learning objectives, even if they have a different output. There are other ways to provide scaffolds as well. In fact, some of the principles that we discussed include scaffolds, like the uh, think alouds, that is actually a scaffold for students and providing the examples for guided practice, another scaffold. Scaffolds can be planned or they can be spontaneous. It takes a little bit more work to plan the scaffolds, but um, they are very, very helpful for learners as we go as they go through a lesson. All right, so I'm going to skip that last poll question, Luciana, but <laughs> as promised. <laughs> Um, here's a list of all of the principal from Merrill and Rosenshine. So we spent some more time on some than others. Uh, we went through Merrill's, all of Merrill's five principles and then touched on um, Rosenshine's. But as you look at this list and think about what we've, we've talked about a little bit, can you put in the chat anything that you learned that you'd like to integrate into your teaching after this? Great, some nice ideas. Okay, while you're continuing to think about other thoughts, transfer from teacher to group, critical thinking, gradual release of responsibility, scaffolds, retelling the story, great. Existing knowledge, presenting by small bits. Previous knowledge to new, yeah, great.
great. Students interests. Nice ideas. Um, continue putting your thoughts in there. That's fantastic. I also wanted to just share if any of you were interested in the uh, keep the ideas coming. This is fantastic. Uh, if any of you were interested in the specific research studies that I talked about, here they are. Excellent. Great. All right. I see a, a few um, questions. Luciana, should we turn to those? Sure. Are you ready for questions? We are. <laughs> OK, well, if you haven't done so yet, feel free to use the Q&A button to ask us questions. It's a little bit easier for me to keep track of the questions when they come through the Q&A rather than the, the chat. But you, you can also use the chat if you feel more comfortable with that. So I'm going to start with the ones that we received during the presentation here. So um, one of the questions from Guillermo, thank you, Guillermo. Um, how could teachers make their students build confidence themselves to have success using academic English? Yeah, great. Um, Guillermo, I saw that you put that question in right away before we even started. So I'm sure you had it in, in your mind as we were going through the material. And I, I hope that you, you heard some of the answers um, in that session. So it is so important that we do that explicit modeling, that think aloud, um, and, and then we also provide that guided practice. So using those two strategies together will really build the confidence of students because they will have already heard you model how to do the skill, and then they will have had the opportunity to do the skill themselves, but with the support of their fellow students and, and with the teacher. And that will really build their confidence as learners and speakers. Right. Well, the next one, um, I find it particularly very interesting. How can we use background knowledge from, from Risa? How can we use background knowledge in teaching language to build new knowledge, especially where the opportunities to practice are limited? So sometimes the only place where the, the, the child, the teenager can speak English is in the classroom. The parents won't speak English. They're not in a country where everybody speaks English. So I find this very interesting. Would love to hear your answer, Janine. Yeah, so, um... I think the key in, in building the background knowledge is finding what in the lesson content would connect to the student's experience. Um, and, um, you know, that's where that, that story that I, I showed where perhaps the setting of the story isn't something that the students could relate to, but the what happened in the story was something that they could relate to. Building background like this doesn't need to take a lot of time. It is something that we can connect um, right up front with our students and, um, and show them, you know, you're going to read a story about um, in this case, it was, you know, somebody getting lost, you know, and, and that quick question of, have you ever experienced getting lost or have you ever lost something? And then as we're going through the reading to be pointing out, gosh, does this remind you of your experience or is this something that you've never experienced before? So just building that in our core teaching can, can really help um, build that background for students. And it doesn't need to take a lot of time. It's just making sure that those connections are clear. Great. Um, so somebody's asking, what do you mean exactly? What do you exactly mean by think aloud sessions? Could you give us an example, please? Yeah, so um, I kind of, I mentioned the idea of uh, going through the steps for, for retelling a story. Um, 
as I, as I mentioned with these think alouds, these work really well with writing. So if I were given a task or if I was having my students do a task that said, um, I want you to write a argument about why we should save water. So let me give you a model. So when I write an argument, I'm gonna start by giving my opinion. So my opinion is, I think we should save water. So I'm gonna write that as my first sentence. I think we must save water. I'm gonna use the word must because I know that's an important persuasive word. So now, and I'm doing this think loud. Now as a writer, I need to think of reasons why I, um, to support my, my uh, opinion that we need to save water. So um, I've learned that water is not something that we have easy access to. And um, I need to make sure that, that you know, we're in a drought and we have to, um, we don't wanna just use it unwisely. So one thing that we can do is turn off the water while we're brushing our teeth. So as a writer, I'm gonna say, one of the things that we really should do to save water is turn off the water as we brush our teeth. And I'm gonna put that in a sentence form and I'm gonna actually be writing this for students as we go through the lesson. So it is just thinking, doing a model, but thinking through out loud for the students each step of the process so that they can see how, how you as a learner and a writer are taking that thinking and applying it to writing or taking that thinking and applying it to reading. All right, well, we have quite a few questions here, but we, we still have some time. Good. Um, oh, we always have this, this question every webinar. What do we do when you have different level of students? How to work with all of them in the same classroom? Yeah, so this is where there's there's no one answer to this, of course, but this is where scaffolds are very important. Um, there are a number of ways that you can provide scaffolds, as I noted. You might have students be doing different versions of a task, a writing task, for instance. Perhaps you have your beginning students, um, they're, they're gonna write a sentence where your intermediate students are able to write more. And so you ask them to write two sentences. You can uh, scaffold the activity that way. You also can, um, and they're doing this all at the same time. You also can provide a scaffold where you have students of different levels purposely working together. So they are supporting each other in their learning. Um, you can have students take different roles in, in the activity. So students who are comfortable doing more speaking can do more speaking than others who are just comfortable saying a word or two. Some things that are important, and you know this so well as teachers, is that all students are participating in the learning, and we don't want to, we don't want to, you know, not give students an opportunity to to um, participate in and um, contribute, but do it at the level where they are comfortable participating. All right. How can we improve vocabulary, Ginny? It's always a challenge. <laughs> yes. Um, so this is where repetition and practice and review is so important. In the programs that you see on the screen right here, we have a um, series of vocabulary routines that we provide for teachers where um, each word is explicitly introduced by the teacher and then practice. And that's just so critical with vocabulary is that we do teach the words very explicitly, word by word. Students need to know the word and what it means. And then we give students many, many opportunities to use it. We allow students to um, read the word throughout the lesson. We ensure that they're writing with the word. We ensure that the, the academic discussions that they are having in the class include the vocabulary. 
generally vocabulary is taught over a period of a couple of weeks. Um, so that repeated practice every day is so important. Getting those, those words from uh, the working memory to the long-term memory. So they're accessible easily and quickly. Okay, so we have one question here. Let me see if I got this right Just from Don uh, Saliba. Can you please talk a bit about using this various criteria? And I, I'm assuming all the, the approaches that you listed during the presentation uh, with regards to teaching to the multiple intelligences. Yeah, so the research that um, that I was sharing with you is for all learners. Um, and th so these approaches do work with, with all learners. Uh, I know uh, by multiple intelligences, I'm thinking that you might meaning those learners who uh, seem to access information well visually or orally or by, by doing kinesthetically. Um, I really would encourage you to try these strategies with all your, your learners because they, they do work. They have been proven to work regardless of um, the intelligence of the student. The, I'm sorry, the intelligence type of the student. All right. Um, so we have another question here. At what stage do you think it's better to correct mistakes while speaking or reading? I'm glad you brought this up. Um, we want to encourage students, and uh, um, we definitely want to encourage students to practice. And this is where that guided practice is so, so critical because um, we want to make sure that they're practicing, but being there and monitoring that practice to ensure that they're practicing correctly is critical. So from the very beginning, we want to correct because um, that, that transfer from something that is just learned to it being fluent before it becomes fluent, we need to make sure that, that the student understands the material correctly. So I would say right away, and I don't, I don't, it, none of us would, would correct a student in a way that is demoralizing or demeaning, but um, gently making sure that they are practicing from the very beginning the skills correctly. All right, I think we have time for two or three more questions, Joe. So. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you can see all the questions, Janine, in the Q&A. We have quite a few here. So if there's any specific question you would like to address, I'm, I'm trying to go through all of them here. Um, which one, which is more important in a second language teaching context, meaning focused instruction or form focused instruction from Reynaldo? Yeah, um, so the, the research that I'm presenting really doesn't get into that. And um, I know that there are both sides of, people have both sides, have opinions on both sides of that question. I would encourage you to, to look into that and, um, and, and, see which, which meets your needs. Um, what we're showing here, these content-based English programs from National Geographic Learning, absolutely focus a lot on building, um, building content, building reading skills, building language skills. And, and they do that with ensuring that students also understand the correct grammar and the correct forms of language. Um, we, with our content-based English programs, we really want to ensure that students have the vocabulary and the skills that they, they need in order to um, read, write, listen, and speak in English, and, and then transfer that knowledge to multiple content areas, and eventually to a career. Okay, we have a few people asking about the materials. So, uh, pretty much all the material that Janine shared during her presentation 
uh, are in the series that we are showing in the screen. You can see the three programs that we have. They're all content-based English programs from National Geographic Learning. So you have Reach for the Stars for kindergarten and then Reach Higher for first through um, fifth or sixth grade. And then we have Lift for middle school students. So for those who are wondering where to find this kind of approach, uh, these are the series that National Geographic Learning uh, created, and Janine is one of the mentors and, and publisher. So um, one more question here. Should we teach young kids grammar or uh, we'd better focus on developing their love for reading? That's from Tom Dunn. Yeah. I don't see that as a either or question. I think we can do both. Um, and, uh, you know, you were talking about these materials, Luciana, and that's what we do in our materials is we provide both that uh, foundation for grammar um, as well as reading. So students will be using that inquiry approach that I mentioned where they're, they're, they're answering a, a question and they answer it by reading, writing, speaking, listening about the topic. And through the course of that, they learn about grammar. So by, by reading um, authentic texts, they're getting exposed to English grammar, but there are also those explicit grammar instruction uh, so that they're ensuring that they understand the grammar skills and that they can apply them correctly. We had a question in the chat, it was, way before we started the Q&A, but I, I was trying to go back and I believe it was from Simonette. And she asked, how can music and movement be integrated? And I, I believe we, we, you could use Reach for the Stars as an example, right, Janine? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, Luciana. Um, in Reach for the Stars and, and in Reach, um, we absolutely include songs to help with the skills that the students are learning. In Reach for the Stars, which is the kindergarten program, we use songs to introduce the language frames or the um, patterns of language that the students will be studying in the unit, as well as the, the phonics elements. So if they're studying the letter um, J, we have a song that's just filled with J words that they can listen to and go back to day after day and hear that wonderful music and they can act it out as they're listening to it. Similarly, in, in Reach Higher, um, we use songs to help students understand the language functions or how to do things like um, describe or share an opinion or tell a story. And um, these songs give an example of those language functions. And it's, it's just a, a fun way for students to be introduced to these concepts and a memorable way too, because of song, of course, songs help us remember things and they can kind of play that song in the back of their head as they're thinking about how, how they themselves will use language in their day-to-day -day lives to share an opinion or tell a story or whatever they're doing. Okay. Well, we, we have quite a few questions. So, uh, okay, I, I keep saying this, but two last ones, I promise. Um, what about assessment? Uh, Nailing Kenny is asking about, do we assess language or content or both? So just as we want to make sure that the independent practice stems from what the, the practice and the teaching was, assessment needs to stem from that. So um, we should always start by knowing what are our learning objectives for the lesson and how are we going to ensure that students met those objectives? If, if the learning objective is for students to write a opinion paragraph, then we're going to teach that, we're going to model how to do it, we're gonna give guided practice on them writing, they're gonna do their independent practice, and then we're going to assess precisely that skill. So the answer to that question is what are you what are you teaching? If, if um, the focus of the teaching is content, that's what you're going to assess. If the focus of the teaching is language, that's what you're going to assess. Using 
to give you an example of what you see in front of you of the, the Reach for the Stars, Reach Higher and Lift programs, these are programs that are meant to build language and literacy. So the assessments in these programs assess language skills of vocabulary and grammar, and they assess reading skills, um, like how to determine the main idea or analyzing characters or things like that, as well as writing skills. Okay, so we have um, somebody asked in the chat here, can we, Maria, uh, can we use these books and how? Yes, of course, you can use these books. You can always go to our website and find, there's a, a sales rep finder. You can find the closest one in your country, in your, your area, and you can um, request, you can ask for information about this series and um, you can get to know more and how to use them. Then we have a whole teacher, uh, teacher resources to, to help you with that. And then as promised, final question, promise you, Janine, this is the last one. Any suggestions on teaching social studies, particularly in history subjects to make it life relatable and particularly processed, uh, process it to their long-term memory? Oh gosh, <laughs> um, Finish with I, a tough one. Yeah, and you know, I my expertise is is more on teaching language and literacy than social studies. So um, I really prefer to defer this one to those who are experts on teaching social studies. I can talk to you about teaching social studies vocabulary, though. We've talked a little bit uh, about that and how to to build those uh, um, words through routines and repetition, and then uh, concepts of of building on foundations that of what students know and relating it to their experience and then also um, explicitly understanding when things are out of their experience and that they need to pay attention maybe a little bit more to understand them um, those are strategies that i'm familiar with with teaching literacy all right well we could be here for another one or two hours i, I, I would i would love to stay but unfortunately we are right at the hour so um janine thank you so much for such an amazing presentation and i i have no doubt that it was quite engaging by the number of questions and and in, in interaction that we got in the chat so thank you very much um, thank you for all of you who have joined it. Uh, before we go, just um, a few reminders and information because some people ask here. Um, immediately after the session, you will be directed to a feedback survey uh, to let us know what you thought about this webinar. So please do share your feedback with us. This is very important. Um, as part of our content-based English webinar series, oh, this is this is the last of our webinar series on content-based English. Uh, but if you are interested in, in watching the two webinars we had before, you can always go to our website and look for webinars, and it's all there. And this webinar will be there as well. Uh, if you're interested in staying in touch, please sign up for our monthly content-based English newsletter, which includes invitations to upcoming virtual events, lots of events happening um, starting January, uh, blog posts, exclusive publishing updates, and more. Uh, to learn more about our content-based English learning programs, please, please visit eltngl.com EMI or contact your local NGL rep. And I just copied and pasted the link for um, the rep finder that I just mentioned. So if you want to go um, to, to our website and take a look at that. And again, um, some people ask, we won't be sharing this presentation, but remember you're going to get the recordings for the session within the five, within five business days. Okay, uh, and a certificate. 
So be sure to join our online community for teachers of English on social media channels where we'll offer up-to-date information about events, practical classroom tips like the ones Janine just gave us today, exciting real-world content and new product information. Um, that's it for today. Janine, thank you again. And thank you for all and each one of you for joining us. Have a great one. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. All right. Bye.